Hello and welcome to Product Popcorn, the podcast that explores topics related to product management, most of the time. We talk with product managers and also designers and engineers that work on product teams, and only sometimes discuss the possibility of artificial intelligence taking over the world. You can always read more at productpopcorn.com. This week on the podcast, I have no fewer than three other female product managers with me to discuss gender in the tech industry. Wait, men, please keep listening. Just with everything that's happened this year, from Susan Fowler's really weird year at Uber to the Google manifesto, I thought I should dedicate an episode to answering some tough questions from women working in tech. I promise you we're not just man bashing for the next hour. We do discuss some tough issues like sexual harassment in the workplace and the gender pay gap. I encourage everyone to listen, since you probably either are a woman or you at least work with women. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Product Popcorn. I'm Kimberly, and I'm a product manager. Uh, Today, we do not have Adam with us. Sigh. But it's because I have three other ladies with me. Say hi, ladies. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, it's a very exciting women in tech episode. So I have several questions um, that are kind of female centric questions. But men, please don't just like delete this episode right now or mark it as played. Keep listening. It's not a man bashing episode. This episode's for men and women because we all have to work together. And you might get some, like, good insight. What was that, like, a uh, Mel Gibson movie in, like, the 90s with Ray Helen Hunt? Ray Where he could... What women, what women want? Yeah, want. Can hear their voices? <laughs> yeah. These are the voices. Yes. And without yes. the anti-Semitic vibe of Mel Gibson. So <laughs> it's a bonus for everybody. Uh, I'm going to let these women introduce themselves. Uh, you guys, we'll start with Car- Carleen, because oh, you know yeah. her. Well, I'm a veteran now, so... Yeah. Um, I'm Carlene, and I'm a product manager. I'm currently working at a company called Closet Box, and we do a revolutionary model for personal storage. I am Caroline. I'm a product manager at Craftsy. I um, just started there this week after almost two years at Havenly. Um, I'm Amy Mayer. I was previously head of product at Havenly, and I'm now just doing some consulting and figuring out my next step. Yeah, freelancing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not going to do any Acronomicon today because we've got a lot of shit to cover. Maybe it'll happen naturally. It might. It probably will. I love editing in those elephants. You know it. <laughs> it's my favorite part of the editing process. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's been a lot going on with... Um, a lot of buzz around women in tech. I've been listening to Ellen Powell's book, Reset, and Prep, for this podcast that we've been planning for many months. I saved all the listener questions from, like, women from the last advice episode for this episode. Sometimes, you know, a woman's point of view. So, should we just jump into it? Yeah, let's yeah. do it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Number one, listener says, I'm a female product manager working on a large enterprise software product at a large tech company. There's another, Pren, male, and Pren, PM, <laughs> at work <laughs> that's being extremely condescending to me, but in a way that's difficult for me to pin down and take evidence to HR. Hmm. For example, when I'm on a call, he will ask for information. Hmm. I will provide the information, and he will say, I'll go check with Greg, <laughs> my male boss. <laughs> yeah, fucking Greg, right? <laughs> um, he interrupts me constantly. He will ask me questions in, in my email, but then ask another man the same questions to verify my answers. How do I deal with this guy and make him trust the information I provide without being labeled a, quote, bitch, unquote? Uh, Ellen Powell says sharp elbows a lot. I also like that. She doesn't want to be accused of having sharp elbows. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of other men, uh, and I get along well with them. So I don't think that I'm hard to work with. Help. Hmm. That's rough. It sounds like a classic mansplainer to me. Yeah, Um, (laughs) yeah, classic case. I think my first gut reaction is that it's not an HR issue, probably. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I know she said she works for a big company, so I mean, maybe that's different there. But I think it's an interpersonal issue, and I would like confront him head on. Yeah. Um, He could be oblivious too. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
that that is true. I think sometimes guys don't totally understand or like to totally realize how they're coming across and just bringing it up, you know, and not beating around the bush, mm-hmm. I think could be really helpful. Part of me also feels like go for the bitch. Like, <laughs> like you don't have to be irrational or overly emotional, but like in, in this case, like judging by the way she's worried about the fact that she may come off as a bitch. To me, it sounds like she, she's not maybe very assertive in the first place. Mm-hmm. You could, Otherwise yeah. she wouldn't be worried about it. And so I would say, like, if you think you're being bitchy, you're probably just asserting yourself a little bit more than you usually would, which in this case is totally okay. Yeah. I think you also wouldn't find very many dudes that would be worried about being, like, mean to another man. Yeah. I can think of a couple of examples. Like, (laughs) Like, I think it's important, though, if you're confronting him about this to bring specific examples. Like, it's not going to be helpful if you come to him and say, you're being a dick. Right. You need to say, when... Every time. Right I after bring, it happens. Right. You yeah. say, when you, like, when you go talk to Greg every time mm-hmm. that I say something, it makes me think that you don't think I'm smart. Is that true? Mm-hmm. I like the question, phrasing like, it as a correct this question. Is, this yeah. is what I'm perceiving. I wish that they could see your eyebrows when you said, <laughs> is this true? Because they were, like, so perfect and, like, very condescending. So, but like, the if you ever... say you being a dick. If you ever... Yes, yes. If you ever meet Karen in person, ask her for the eyebrows. That's good. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. Number two. Okay. I'm a young woman working in tech early in my career. This is my first year. What a crazy year. <laughs> With the Google manifesto and the hashtag MeToo explosion on Facebook, mm-hmm. I've started thinking, what do I do if I'm sexually harassed at work? I've actually been really lucky, and in the first nine months of my career, I haven't had any negative experiences thus far, but I just want to be prepared, and I'm wondering what steps I should take if I ever do find myself in this situation. This is a great question, and I actually want to hear your feedback because I don't know yeah. <laughs> yeah. either. Like, you know, I've had, I mean, I'm sure we've all had experiences where, like, inappropriate things are said or, you know, it's kind of a gray area. But I've never, like, outright had a guy at work, you know, touch me and say you're not getting a raise unless you do this. You know, like, <laughs> anything, like, over. <laughs> so I am curious because I always read online, like, you need to speak up. But what does that look like, actually? Like, what yeah. are the specifics of speaking up? I, I think, did you guys read the Susan Fowler blog post? Yes. Uber and you thing? know that that was really, like... That was kind of the start of a lot. I mean, it felt like the start of a mm-hmm. lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. the summer. TLDR on that. She was at Uber for a year, and basically, she was an engineer on her first day. Her engineering manager oh, was, yeah. like, just... basically, like... I want Do you want to sleep with, with me? Yeah. yeah. Which is just... V- Incredibly and she strange. screenshot. That's not okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> for women early okay. in your career, not okay. For and men. Also for men. Yeah. That's not also, okay. yeah, never okay. <laughs> this needs to get out. But yeah. this is the thing: this is that is like your coworker, yeah. don't ask them to have sex with you. Right. <laughs> and not on their first day. Not, I'm maybe, just kidding. Not yeah. ever. Not, not ever. Not ever. Um, but I think she did a fabulous job of of like taking as much as you can taking the emotion out of the situation and just straight up documenting everything I think you brought this up too can really like yeah just screenshotting stuff she took stuff to HR which in this case I would definitely say this is an HR problem mm-hmm. um she got a lot of pushback from HR which you know was a part of the kind of broader culture issue at Uber but mm-hmm. I mean I think indirectly kind of led to Travis having to step down oh totally she totally did and you know it's it's interesting though I mean I always say like document 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 because you can't be first off you cannot be emotional if you ever do make that type of complaint I think it needs to be like very just black and white emotionless here here are the data points almost um otherwise you're kind of branded as like a Crazy, frantic woman. I hate the word frantic, by the way. It's like my <laughs> least favorite word. It's only used for women. Um, and, true, actually. you know, they always say, like, you need to tell someone. Like, even... Because that's the first yes. thing they're going to do is leave ask. You yeah. need to leave yeah. a trail. Is The first thing they're going to do is, did you tell anybody Who else about this? this? Yeah. yeah. So I think telling somebody that you trust immediately is very important. 
and even, you know, maybe an email so that there's a written trail, but documenting as much as you can. However, it like what worries me is that like Susan Fowler did all of those things. She right. went to HR, nothing happened. Right. And what That's do you not do in guarantee? What do you do? Yeah. You leave. I mean, yeah. You know, yeah. Hopefully you have you can leave, you know, and you're not in a yeah. situation where you have to stay or stay yeah. well, and that, or whatever. But. but that I think that would be my advice. Like there's no guarantee. Even if you follow all the right steps, you document stuff, you go to HR, you would hope that they fire this douchebag and you can continue your job. But that's not always the case. And so I think my advice would be like don't Prepare yourself so that you never are stuck in a job. Yeah. Build your mm-hmm. skills, build your network, and build your savings yes. so that, like, if you have to leave, you can leave right. and you don't ever feel trapped in a job where there's some scumbag being inappropriate. I mean, that's, like, the ultimate cultural misalignment, right? Like, if you're working at a place that lets women be abused, like, not okay. I would leave a company you're for much out. less than that if I didn't yes. feel like culturally I was aligned. So mm-hmm. I, I love that, Caroline. I think that makes so much sense. And here's another question. So I'm in an online Facebook group called Tech Ladies, and this is something that's kind of been discussed before just in various posts. Is like, you know, I'm, I'm in a whatever type of hostile work environment. Um, you know, do you wait until you get a new job to leave or do you leave? And my point of view on that is always – Stay as long as you possibly can without, you know, wanting, without, I guess, compromising your sanity, but you always have more negotiating power if you're currently employed. And, you know, I realize that could take months, but what's your guys' point of view on that? I don't know. I think it depends on where you're at in your life and what Mm -hmm. you're sacrificing by staying. Yeah. Um, I left my job earlier this summer and this was the first time I had left without something lined up and it was really scary but ultimately it was the right call for me yeah I would also say too I I worry a lot about sexual harassment escalating like I I think a lot of cases of assault that you hear actually start as you know the simple yeah something more innocent sexual harassment and so that that's what I would also worry about is if Mm -hmm. if for whatever reason you you carve out the sense that like these things can happen and it's okay and nothing's done about it like what else are they going to do i mean the harvey weinstein mm-hmm. thing is a perfect mm-hmm. example of this and there it's repeat behavior too so actually i mean what what where i would probably start is asking other women at the office if it's yeah. that have worked with him mm-hmm. or been you know had some sort of contact with yeah. this guy like have you had a similar experience because there's yeah. definitely power in numbers i would i think also like the tides are changing with this, and yeah. I think people are listening to women more. Um, you know, maybe not always believing them the first time, but I think it's they're quicker to believe women. Um, and women are naming names, and I think that's really fucking scary for guys, mm-hmm. which yeah. is good. Uh, speaking um, of naming names, can you talk about yeah. Justin Caldwell? Yeah, th- I mean, this is really not my story to tell in so many ways, but Justin Caldwell was one of the guys who this summer sort of, you know came to terms with his fate after uh, harassing and, you know, borderline abusing a lot of women. Um, He's a VC um, with Binary Capital or previously with Binary Capital, and he was on the board at Havenly. And um, once this all came to light, Lee, who is the CEO of Havenly, very powerful, strong, and smart woman, uh, decided to cut ties with him and basically kicked him off the board. And the amount of support that she got through that process was really amazing. Caroline was there for Mm -hmm. that too. Um, you know, the rest of the board members were incredibly supportive. The rest of the community was incredibly supportive. Um, and so I think in that really tough situation, at least from my perspective, I was like, there are a lot of really decent humans Mm -hmm. still. And, you know, there might be a good handful of like really shitty humans out there, but it's not the majority. Mm -hmm. Um, Totally. And I think that it is so important that women speak up and name names, and let's not stop doing that because yeah. um, it really does feel like it's it's a powerful thing right now. Yeah, yeah. That whole situation got me thinking about the like, what if I were to be harassed? And I think just seeing how everyone at Havenly, both men and women, were supporting this whole situation mm-hmm. and you know calling it what it was, um, kind of made me think like, if this were to happen to me, like find a female mentor. Yeah multiple even and tell them what happened like mm-hmm. they're gonna have your back that's true yeah. Like, yeah 
Um, I just think, like, we are so much better together and, like, supporting each other. And that's a really, like, I think that could maybe be a good move if, say, yeah. HR isn't totally. the mm-hmm. best. Find your yeah. tribe. And, yeah. you know, those should be women that you're very comfortable and confiding in. Yes. So- Number three. I like this one a lot, and I struggle with this, and I, I, I want to hear what you guys think. How much womanness can you show at work? I it's love a, the word womanness. I know, me too. It's a, it's a so many Webster's things dictionary. In <laughs> at some companies, the way fe- for females to succeed is to act more like a man, like be competitive, headstrong, direct, uncompromising. But when is it okay to show empathy at work? And you have to hide all of your quote unquote womanness to be successful. Mm. Great question. That's a really good question. I think you have to know your culture to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but I also really believe that the traits that make us feminine are the same traits that make people really good product managers when it mm-hmm. comes to empathy mm-hmm. and. Um, building rapport with people yep. and being able to build interpersonal relationships with all types of personalities. Um, not that men can't do that. I've seen lots of really, really, you know, great men who are product managers and are great at that, but I think it comes more naturally to women. Yeah. I always sort of skew towards being yourself yep. and yep. not, you know, trying to pretend to be yep. more like a man. Cause you don't want to do that for the rest of your life. It's mm-hmm. so exhausting. I also wonder too, like, when we say, like, be like a man, is that really how men are, too? No, it's how they're taught like, to be. Like, it's how they're Sorry, taught to be. And so, to me, anytime either sex, like, buys into that, we're taking a step backwards as a culture. Yeah. You know? Like, we shouldn't... Yeah. None of us should feel boxed into that, including men. I mean, I've been called bossy since I was, like, four years old, you know? <laughs> like, and, you know, they only call little girls bossy, of course, but... Um, and that's- now CEO potential is what we call that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of my high school friends actually posted on Facebook that like my daughter is getting called bossy and you know, I grew up in a small town, so kind of small Midwestern town, perhaps not as progressive as the rest of the country, but and I wrote back, you know, that means she's CEO potential. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't she's a leader. Yeah. Yeah, you're lucky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, we'll move on. Number four. I'm a young, well, a lot of these are, like, young. young. Yeah, I feel like they're, well, there's a lot of novice PMs yeah. listening to the pod. They need advice. Um, <laughs> she says, two years experience on the job. So, I find the hardest part of my job is doing product demos. I just mean, like, sprint demos in front of internal teams. Um, I'm one of the three females in my smallish tech company and I just get really intimidated standing in front of all those men including the engineers my architect all the c-level guys since we're a small company they all come to sprint demos um what can I do to become a more confident speaker and to not be intimidated by speaking in front of a large group of men power poses Yeah, you haven't listened to the TED talk on power poses okay that was debunked that TED talk I think this one? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You guys can't see me. I'm, I'm in the, like I'm in the jumping out. jack yeah. pose. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think what was really in that TED Talk that I liked was like, I think she said something like, fake it until you become it. Mm-hmm. Like, you just have to try. Like, nobody knows what they're doing. That is a fact. Everybody is winging it. Everyone to is to winging it. And once you, like, understand that, then all you have to do is be more confident pretending that you know what you talk you're talking about and then you do know what you're talking about. So true. <laughs> yeah. There's two yeah. things that I do that make me more confident whenever I have to speak in front of a large group. One is just like this is almost too obvious, but just like be prepared. Mm-hmm. Just like get to work early at seven o'clock when nobody's there and like do your presentation to the wall and mm-hmm. like speak out loud and mm-hmm. you know Or, you know, at home, if you're more comfortable doing it at home. But literally, like, stand up and go through exactly what you're going to say. You'll just feel a lot more confident, I think, when you get in front of the group. And then the other thing is just, like, to imagine the worst-case scenario. Because the worst-case scenario probably isn't that bad. And once you've, like, worked that through your head, like, this is the absolute worst thing that could happen. It's like, I fall on my ass and, 
you know, I don't know, throw up in front of everybody. <laughs> and then whatever happens, which is probably not those things, is going to seem way better. Yeah, you know? I think it does. I mean, it, it gets easier the more you do it. It yeah, does. So, I mean, it just, every, I feel like every, especially if you're doing it consistently, every week is going to get a little bit easier. And then the other thing I would do, just sort of unpacking the anxiety, like, what are you kind of to your point like what are you actually anxious about Mm -hmm. it's probably what all those men think about you Mm -hmm. and so just ask them like rather than wonder like to mitigate that like put it out there tell some people in that room that you trust hey I'm working on this skill and then get their feedback afterward I would also one thing I've also done because I feel like I still hate sprint demos, like, deep in my core. I really <laughs> do. Like, kind of for the same reasons this person's mentioning. But I hate I hate sprint demos because they feel like these, like, formal, stuffy presentations to me that aren't collaborative and don't, you know, like, don't foster the kind of relationship that I typically like to have. And so one thing I do is when I get in the room... I crack a joke, I talk about the weather, (laughs) like, I bring up something funny that happened, like, break down the walls a little bit Mm -hmm. and make people feel like people, and as soon as they feel like other humans and not, like, these coworkers and higher positions, it's much easier to communicate with. It feels more like a conversation and less, like, you're talking to. Exactly. I remember at Craftsy, it was kind of a, like, we're doing it live moment, and everyone in the audience was encouraged, like, if something during this demo breaks, everyone claps. (laughs) (laughs) it's just like that should be expected this isn't supposed to be perfect it's just to show progress um and it should be easy and fun and like no big deal uh number five this one near and dear in my heart uh i am an older woman older is in quotes (laughs) early 50s call that pretty young Young, nowadays but anyway um who has moved to the Denver area recently, and I've started to look for a job. I have over two decades of experience working in tech, but as I'm in my early 50s, I'm often interviewed by people much younger than me, and I wonder what they're thinking. What's your advice in my job search? Should I avoid startups? Should I concentrate on large companies, government agencies, nonprofit? I'm really curious as to what younger people think when they interview a quote-unquote older woman. Hmm. It's a great question. I think she needs to think about what she wants in terms of lifestyle because the reason that startups attract younger people is because they're able to put in the hours and, you know, Mm kind of go through the slog of working. They don't have kids usually. (laughs) There's not not that many sacrifices that they're making by being at the office, you know, for 12 hours a day or whatever. I don't don't think startups are off limits, um, but I would definitely look at the culture of the company Mm -hmm. because I do think like many startups think culture means like beer and ping pong Mm -hmm. yeah where that might not be a great fit for you but others just mean like we're super transparent or we work really hard like that is kind of an ageless but there value. Is, I mean, there is this, like, culture fit thing yes. that happens. Like, it's I a don't big deal. Like, I don't want to pretend like that doesn't happen mm-hmm. where, you know, I've definitely been in situations where I've interviewed someone and, like, you know, in the debrief, there's sort of this, like, well, oh, he's not a culture fit or whatever. And Which really is like, some other underlying yeah. issue right. that right. could be, like, it racism. Be those, like, different or, people. Yeah. Totally. yeah. But but I, the I, things you, you're not allowed. Yeah. yeah. I I interviewed at a startup in the Denver area, would have been a couple years ago now, and I remember that there was, um, like, everybody in the office seemed to be in their early 20s. And in the interview, they asked me a bunch of questions about my college, like, experience, which was so long <laughs> ago for me now. I was, like, trying to remember. They're like, who was your most influential professor? I'm oh, like, God. I don't even remember any of my professor's names. Yeah. Like, do you know how long? I graduated from college in, like, 2002. Like, I don't know. There was one woman I remember that I interviewed with last, and she had a lot of experience. She went into detail about it, and I could just tell, you know, she was she was probably in her early 50s. And it actually gave me confidence. Like, oh, you know, this isn't just some frat house. Like, th- mm-hmm. there's a woman there's a it, later in her career yeah. here with a lot of experience, and it, it gave me, like, more confidence in working there. Yeah. I would, like, really encourage, like, smaller companies to hire women with yeah. more experienced yes. women um, because it, it does kind of give you, like, a, I think, a, a better culture in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. I yeah. I, I don't know if I have any other specific advice, though. 
I mean, I what hope that we get jobs when we're in our fifties? Are people gonna hire us? <laughs> I think about that. Seriously, all I think about that a lot. And I don't know what the world's gonna look They'll like. They'll be like then. robots by then, and none, none of us have to work, right? <laughs> right? We're either not gonna be working well, or we're we gonna be starving money? to death. So, <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh. I don't think robots. I mean, there's like a lot of critical thinking required for product people yeah. to I make. Think, I mean, I think robots will replace us like last. I think they we'll probably, so well. like, we'll make the robots, and then they'll replace us. Oh. Because we'll make them, and they'll be good. <sighs> you guys, I think about <laughs> no. this constantly. Oh, guys, okay. I have an Alexa in my house, and she's an idiot. And if She that's, sucks, like, man. Alexa robot, sucks. Like, she's like, I don't know what you mean. I'm like, I asked you a very similar question. <laughs> but if your husband says it, she knows. Wait, really? Yeah, I feel like their QA people are all men. Is Alexa <gasps> sexist? Oh, what? yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? She is. No, when my husband gets home, I will show you in the kitchen. My husband will be like, hey, Alexa, like, do a dance and set a timer for me. And she'll be like, yes, Bill. I love you. <laughs> and, like, for me, I'm like, Alexa, stop the timer. And she's like, what, bitch? Like, <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> beep, Alexa, beep. I'm like, oh, my God. Changing. She made fun yeah. of my Chicago accent. That's, like, pretty much my only interaction <laughs> with her so far. I was like, Alexa, turn down or turn up the heat on the nest. And she was like... I can't find a device called Nast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like, know. I'm, done here. So I'm just going to walk over and turn the damn thing up. <laughs> anyway. All right. Six. <laughs> Number six. I just got a big promotion. Yay. Yay, Yay is in parentheses. Congratulations. Yeah, that's great. And then I found out that my replacement for my lower level position cool. Is making more money than me. Oh. Parentheses. Boo. Yeah. Double boo. <gasps> like making more money than her with her promotion mm-hmm. salary. Um, it's worth saying that my replacement is male. Is there anything I can do about this? Should I make a complaint with HR? That mm. really sucks. And this is like, hard. That's like, super like, shitty. If you can just avoid knowing how much people get paid, that is better. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Yeah. Well... I don't know how much good can come from knowing yeah. how much your colleagues get paid, but I will say that men are more likely to negotiate their salaries. Mm-hmm. Um, if he came in at a higher rate, there's just a lot of unknowns. Yeah. Um, and so I wouldn't go to HR and say, like, I found out how much. Yeah, that'd be an awkward paid, conversation. Right. But I, I would talk to your boss and make it clear that you are willing to do what it takes to, like, get to the next level in terms of salary. And Get a specific list of things that you need to work on. Yeah. It is hard. You're right about, like, kind of ignorance is bliss and a lot of (laughs) situations like these because you can't unknow that information once you know. And I was was in a similar situation uh, way back when in my career where, yeah, I got promoted and a guy came in, was doing my old job, and was definitely, like, making more money than me. And it's just like... How did you find that out? Um... I feel like the guy told me. That's no, cool. you know, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. The boss of the guy no. told me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's an interesting. Choice. It was rough. It was really rough, and I it was hard for me to get over it. But there was right. literally like at, at the time, and I was <laughs> I was younger, so I was like much less experienced at this point in my life. But I felt like there was nothing I could do. Hmm. Huh. Just sours are experienced too. What yeah. is the saying? Like comparison is the source of all unhappiness, or something like that. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's, like, you want to strive for equality, but at the end of the day, like, you need to feel content with your compensation for your skills. Mm -hmm. I think you're onto something, too, though, with the negotiation. Like, I think just inherently women don't do that as much. Yeah. And when we don't do that, we end up in these situations, and it's it's much harder to, like, go back and ask for a raise. Yeah. You always feel like it's not been enough time, or Mm -hmm. you haven't learned this, that, or the other, but, like... I feel like just kind of taking care of that stuff up front is the way to go when you can. Always just negotiate as hard as you can when you change mm-hmm. jobs. Because mm-hmm. once you're in a job, like you said, it is, it's, I, I think it is much harder to negotiate raises once you're already at a company. That's, yes. Totally oh, absolutely. Yes. Because then it's like kind of what leverage you have. Right. Like, I don't right. know. It's, it's just a whole other ball game, but. Yeah. Um, one, when you're early in your career, you need to get a couple of like step function changes in yeah. salary. And yeah, the only way that that's really going to happen is by switching jobs. Yeah. From at least from my experience. One, mm-hmm. um, 
so I've been reading, I've been listening. I say read, but my reading is listening nowadays because my commute is quite long. Uh, I've been listening to this book called Never Split the Difference. Um, fantastic. The FBI I almost, thing. Yeah. yeah I almost really don't want to tell anybody about it because I feel like it's giving me an edge. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want everybody else to know my secrets. Um, but he talks about salary negotiation in the book. This guy was an FBI hostage negotiator. Um, he was the top. A hostage negotiator at the FBI for decades, and now he's like applying those principles to business. And he talks mm. about negotiating a salary, but only for a new job, not within mm. your existing job. Um, but he talks about a story about uh, Robin Williams and how he did the voice of the genie in Aladdin, and he did it for some cut rate like seventy five thousand dollars, just because he didn't know it was going to be a big movie, mm. and he just wanted to leave something behind for his kids that was like joyful. And so he's like, "I'll just do it for seventy five grand," even though I mean he was making millions of dollars per movie at this point. Well, then Aladdin's like a huge hit, <laughs> and he's pissed, and he's like, "What? I only got seventy five thousand dollars," and they were like. You are cool with it until you found out how much the movie made. <laughs> then he wasn't cool with it anymore. So, um, yeah, he and Disney had this kind of back and forth. But I thought that was, like, an interesting lesson. Like, just try to be, mm-hmm. like, I don't want to say just be complacent. Just be, like, happy with what you get. Because that's how, on average, we make less than men. Mm-hmm. But So negotiate. But, yeah, learning that somebody makes more or less than you, I do not ask co-workers at all yeah that's what kind of my question so like recently going through a negotiation it's hard to know what to look at as a source of truth for what i should be asking like product is so different across mm-hmm. cities across mm-hmm. industries True. you can get and on when blind I look at you know average for denver i'm like What's that I don't know. Yeah. Like, so blind. So look? so look on blind. Um, uh, yeah. If you are negotiating for a job, obviously there's pay scale. There's Glassdoor. Um, we talked about this last advice episode. Like talk to recruiters. Try to get an idea. But the best thing that you can do now is blind. And blind is like a new app. Um, it's a social networking app for tech workers, but it's completely anonymous. Hmm. So like there's like every big tech company like Facebook has a room. Twitter has a room. Um, and then, you know, you have managers and people that work at these companies and they're like half the conversations on there are like, I just got this offer. Is it good or not? And like 10 people will comment. Wow. No, you should negotiate for more. What oh. city are you in? Ask for this much. Huh, um, it's, cool. it's very helpful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, number eight, because I'm, wait, what does it say? Ah, got it. Number eight. This one's about work-life balance. Um, because of where I'm at in life with a young baby at home, I think a lot about balancing work and life slash family these days and the pressure to do it all. I think this is something that comes up eventually for pretty much every woman who chooses to have a family and a career. Do you have any advice for how to balance everything? I will tell you there is one article on Medium that I read this week, and I would think every woman should um, read, especially if they're not married yet, that the mo- it, it was titled, The Most Important Career Decision You'll Ever Make is Who You Marry. Mm. I was like, yes. <laughs> that is true. Why? That's like a Cheryl. Because if your, husband, <laughs> if your husband doesn't support you having a career and isn't, oh. like, helpful, yeah, yeah. then when you have a baby, guess what? He's not going to be helpful well, then either. And also, like, you, you need him to do half. Right. Stuff. <laughs> Things. Right. Him or her. Right. She, oh, yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah. You Your partner in general. Your SO to do half of things. And, yeah. And I think that needs to be, like, do the half you're good at. He needs to figure out, or she needs to figure out the half that they're good at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's hard. And it's. I think it's never going to be, like, perfectly balanced. Yeah. Um, I, I was telling the, the ladies um, before we started. I said ladies really creepy there. It's fine. <laughs> the ladies. Um, ladies. <laughs> that was ladies with a Z. <laughs> You know, uh, I was telling them before we started recording that um, I, there have been some women I've asked to be on the podcast and they mentioned that they are not able to because they have children. And yet I've had a lot of men with children hmm. on the podcast suspiciously. Interesting. So, you know, where's Do you think daddy? Some of that comes from <laughs> like wanting to prioritize your life differently. Yes. Yeah. Because I think, so I'm, like, going to pop out of small human soon. So I, th- I think about this what? a lot. Like, <laughs> you know, even having, like, a 45-minute commute, I'm, I imagine myself 
wanting that 45 minutes back with my kid. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's just a woman thing, but I, I think it's I maybe think stronger. I think women feel it more acutely, and I don't know if that's, like, a biologic, biological thing yeah, or maybe. a sociological thing. I don't know. But, yeah, I mean, I it, you have a kid, and it reorients your entire life. Mm-hmm. And I think that for a woman who is driven and career-oriented and motivated um, – who maybe has been defined by work in a lot of ways, yeah. it can be kind of a shock to the system because you're like, okay, the pie chart of my life used to be like 70-30, like 70% yeah. job and maybe 30% yep. spouse and other relationships. Right. And you wedge a kid in there and all of a sudden it's like, I don't yeah. know who I am anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is where the Alan, Ellen Powell quote comes in. That I, I was listening to Ellen Powell's book today, um, Reset, and she talks about, like, maternity leave. And I don't think it's like this in the Denver area. But, you know, she was working for, like, high-power venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. And she said her maternity leave was treated like a – like, she abandoned a ship during a typhoon to get a manicure. Oh, Lord. And I thought that was just – I laughed out loud, and I literally had to rewind and listen to it four times so I could memorize it for this podcast. <laughs> but I just was like, gosh, if I ever have to take maternity leave, if it's treated that way, mm-hmm. I will. People do say it that. Sucks. They're like, oh, enjoy your time your off. Your vacation. Oh, yeah, your time yeah. off. Yeah. There's Good. been a couple, a couple, jo- my company's really great, but there's been a couple jokes, like my six week six to 12 week vacation that's coming out. Why don't you tell them that you're going to call them every time the baby wakes up? Call them when you're in labor. (laughs) Call them when you're screaming in labor. Every time you're nursing the kid. Yes. For like literally eight hours a day. Yes. Oh my God. The maternity leave is not that fun. It's great bonding time. Yeah. But it's a lot of work. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I think, you know, what I'm learning in this realm is that, um, you just need to be a little bit more selective and a little bit more particular about people and places and where you're spending your time and who you're spending your time with and finding your tribe of women, again, who will support you and come alongside you and talk you out of shit when you're being irrational and you're saying, like, I want to quit and blah, blah, blah. Like, things will get better in the first mm-hmm. The first six months of having a new baby are really, really hard. Do you think it's the same for men? Do you think, like, men have that same struggle? I don't think it's... I don't think they do. I mean, I don't know. My husband is amazing, um, and he's a psychologist. He's very, like, in tune with a lot of things about himself. But I don't... I don't think that he felt the shift in identity as much as I did. Here's okay, so this is not a question that I have written down, but I'm just YOLOing now. Um, <laughs> what, what do you guys do? You guys think that unconscious bias is like a real thing? And can you do you have any examples of if you've experienced Against it recently? Women or? Yeah, just like unconscious bias of, um, you know, maybe even going back to the interrupting thing, like maybe men don't even realize that they interrupt women more than other men, perhaps, yeah. or a certain, mm-hmm. a, not all men, but certain men, um, and perhaps that they do have, like, an unconscious bias against against women that they don't even notice. Yeah, I think that's a real thing. I, I think we all do that, too. Yeah. yeah. What's that online test you can take where you, like, associate words with things? Oh. And it shows you how. Does, does it tell you if you're, like, racist or something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did oh. it with male and female. And I am, oh. like, feminist. I believe women can do anything that a man can do and better. Yeah, and yeah. my results were that it was, like, do you associate females with home and men with work? Uh-oh. And I have a slight preference for men with work. And I was like, no, this is wrong. <laughs> the test is flawed. And I do believe the test was flawed. But anyway, like, it's mm-hmm. it's there. It's in women, too. Like, we have, as yeah, society, absolutely. we have grown up. Even my mom works. I think, Israel, I think in my own career, the, the place that I've most noticed it is, I think to some extent, at least for a couple more years, no matter how much experience I have, how many companies I work at, how many things I've done, I will have to come into companies and earn the reputation and the trust yes. that I get. Yeah. But then you you see men come into the company and they're just immediately the expert. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think to me that's the most obvious place. And I don't think anybody means to treat women that way, but I, I think it does happen. Yeah. Well, there's that classic Harvard study that I think goes back to like the 70s and it was like the Harry and Harriet or 
I can't oh, remember. Yeah, yeah. Wait, is it Harry and Harriet? Yeah. They, they had two resumes, oh, yep. mm-hmm. and they would talk about them in classes. Um, so they split the classes. Um, some of them got the Harry resume, and some of them got the Harriet. I don't know if it was Harriet. It was an H name. That was mm-hmm. maybe it was Heather. Um, and same exact resume. Um, one was male, and one was female name, and all like consistently, men and women graded the male resume as more. Uh, Qualified, and there's mm. narratives that they tell where it's like a very strong leader, with yeah, the name, with the yep. changeable name, and the woman is classified as a bitch, and the mm-hmm. man is classified as a strong leader. Yeah, and I think this was like decades ago, but I bet yeah, if you were I th- to do it again, that you would find similar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think it would have changed. Well, hopefully, it changed a little, but yeah. I'm just wondering, like, I think this is something every woman knows to be true. Like, how do we change it? What are our no, action no. items? No, I guys? know, I don't. I struggle <laughs> with this. I'm like. What what do we do? And I don't know. did you? I mean, I, did you guys read Lean In? Yeah, you I know, didn't know. Yeah, it's like well, I know the principles. So. My my husband said I'm not allowed to read it again. Um, <laughs> it's very bad. I want to lean in. I want to lie down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what yeah, was her um, name? Allie, Allie, Allie Wong. Wong. I really resonate with that. Yeah, it's the best. <laughs> she's like my spirit animal. I, I love her. She was so pregnant too. She was she so that special. Was so great. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I've always that. like wondered, like you know, what 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 can you do? And like, do do you take the Cheryl Sandberg route where she's like, take a seat at the table? She is, she, um, you know, prides herself in being very empathetic. She says she's cried at work. She's asked for hugs. Like, mm-hmm. she's uh, going back to womanness. She definitely advocates for that. Um, but then, you know, listening to Ellen Powell's book today, which ba- main takeaway of Ellen Powell's book is do not work in venture capital as a woman. It sounds mm-hmm. horrible. But, you know, she was accused of being aggressive, having sharp elbows, Um and, and there was a lot of just unconscious bias stuff going on in there. Like, just being cut out of email threads, being cut out mm, of emails, yeah. um, not being listened to, and then ending up being right basically all the time. Right. Uh, and I just, I don't know really what to do about that. I, I think, like, for better or worse, my my tactic has been to, like, find way, like, not manipulate people. I don't think <laughs> that. Influence. Right, but, like, <laughs> like find ways to... Um, Build yourself up. You have to really, and I think this is going back to like the women as PMs Mm -hmm. question. Um, I think women are really good at reading people. And I think Mm -hmm. you have to know your audience and figuring out what's going to work with specific people and like you kind of just using that. I I, I'm sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, I sometimes think too, like, especially like I'm about to have a daughter, right? And so a lot of this is on my mind. And I think. I think another thing we can do is just, like, make sure we're leading healthy and fulfilling lives. Like, I think about mm-hmm. that a lot. Like, I want to mm-hmm. fight the good fight, and I want to I want to do what I can. But at the end of the day, like, change has been happening over a long period of time. And we'll probably – we haven't arrived, and it will probably continue to happen over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. So my, my, like, personal stance, too, is, like, I always want to keep myself healthy and happy – and make sure I feel like I'm doing what is right for me, whether or not that means you work as a woman yes. or you stay home or you work full time or you work part time or whatever you do. Like to me, that's the best example that we can set. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna end this on one note because I just wanna I just wanna write a falsehood that I've heard a lot on the internet is completely random. It has absolutely nothing to do with what we were talking about before. <laughs> um, you know, with the so, I'm going to see how many times I can say Ellen Powell in this podcast, mm-hmm. but I'm just going to bring it up one more time. <laughs> Sorry, guys. for her book. No, I kind of, just because I was listening to it today. And I was you like, should just also tweet at her and see if she'll make she's us a, famous. She's a friend of the pod, just like Warren Buffett. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of fake, fr- fake friends of the pod. It's fake news. <laughs> um, whenever I hear about, like, a big, um, you know, sexual harassment claim or whatever, I hear or I see people on social media saying she just wants like a settlement or she just wants Mm. to win a lawsuit. And this drives me. Why would any woman want that kind of attention? First off, why why would you want to destroy your life? Secondly, just read Ellen Powell's book and you will see like why nobody would go. If you could not pay me $2 million to go through Mm -hmm. what she went through, maybe even like 10 million, I don't even think it would be worth it. Um, she ended up paying like a million dollars of her own money for her legal, her oh. legal fees. And then get this, if you lose, you got to pay their yes. legal fees too. So awful. millions of dollars. I mean, she's lucky that she's in, she's 
says this. She's lucky that she had the resources to be able to fight that fight. And she knew she was probably going to lose um, at the end of the day. But if it's that hard for a woman with that much money mm. and that much influence to win what quite honestly is a case closed situation if you read about it. It is absurd what she went through and how much evidence was had. If she can't win, I will tell you, freaking nobody is getting Mm. any money out of these sexual harassment cases. They just really aren't. It's, I feel like it's such a misconception of society. Like when was the last time we ever heard of a woman winning a big suit like that? No, if this, ever. Some of this, like, Bill O'Reilly stuff. Like, that, mm. you know. But they get uh, a good some payout, NBA. too. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm just, like, wondering, like, when. I can't even think of a high-profile case. When was this? When was the Ellen Powell stuff? This was, like, several years Recently. Ago, right? 20, I feel like the, the suit was in maybe 2015. Okay. And she didn't. I mean, she says, like, she didn't settle because she wanted to be able to write the book yeah. and talk mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. She could have probably settled, but. Yeah. She didn't. It does feel a little bit like, and maybe I'm being naive, but it does feel like this summer, the past few months, that Mm -hmm. things are shifting. Yeah. And that it's not about money, but it's about power and numbers of women feeling confident and comfortable to, again, like name names and speak up. Mm -hmm. And the more women who do that, the less of a problem this will be over time. Um, Was it to the Weinstein stuff? Didn't like Woody Allen come out and he was like, this is just going to start a witch hunt for, like, yes. anyone who, like, mm-hmm. slaps a butt. And it's like, don't slap a don't butt. Don't slap a butt. <laughs> it's actually not that hard to not sexually like, harass people. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. My friend Julian always says, I somehow managed to become a 40-year-old man without raping or sexually harassing anybody. I don't know how I did it. Yeah. 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 You know? And totally. Yeah. That's where we need our, our homeboys, too. We need the dudes do. to step in and help with that stuff because I think – in the past, I think it's been hard for men to speak up to for a variety of reasons when they see that stuff happen to women. Yeah. Because they want to be so, cool or, like, they're, like, taught to fit in. Yeah, nobody yeah. – I just think That's, nobody wants to, like, put themselves out there in that way. I, don't, I also think, like, talking to a lot of dudes, like, I don't think they realize it. Yeah. It's like – they're like, does this happen to you? And it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, very informally all the time. You know, if mm-hmm. you walk, you get cat call. Like, just little stuff. That was part like, of the Me Too thing. all the time. And to a point where, like, I just ignore some of these things now. Mm-hmm. But men, like, good dudes don't believe that happens. Because they don't do it. Right. And their friends probably don't do right. it. And they're not going to cat call you when you're with the dude. The one thing I want to say as a closing note is, like, I feel, for what it's worth, that I've worked with a ton of really amazing men me yes. too. Who have not made me feel like that, who have not sexually harassed me in any form, and who have been supportive. That, who, have, who have sponsored me yes. and been my support system and my, you know, yeah. really mm-hmm. helped advance my career with no expectations of yes. anything like that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I've had two really great male mentors, I would say. Yeah. And I don't want that to be a result of all this either, where it's yeah. like mm-hmm. men don't feel like they're able to, you know, like the whole Mike Pence thing, like he doesn't go to dinner with any woman. Who's right. Not Which that sucks for anybody that works for him. How are you right. supposed to advance your career right. if you can't go to dinner with your Like boss. it becomes like a different form of sexism almost when yeah. you're like women can't get ahead working for him when they can't. No engage with yeah, him in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't want that. It's like, hey, Mike Pence, it. just like, don't be creepy, right? But like, to all the good dudes, keep doing what you're doing because yes, it really, it really does matter to us. Yes, yeah. Seriously, keep supporting us too, please. We need you. Yes, you outnumber true. us in tech. <laughs> <laughs> we really need you. Yeah. <laughs> need your numbers. Um, and we like you too. Anyway, all right. That's all we got. All right. Well, uh... Girl power. Yeah. <laughs> See, men, aren't you glad that you listened all the way through? You got so much good information. There's, like, two people nodding. <laughs> There's, like, two yeah, men are they still, still listening. listening? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, we'll see y'all next week. Thanks for listening to Product Popcorn. You can subscribe to the podcast or leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. You can always read more at productpopcorn.com or follow us on Twitter at Product Popcorn. 